Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Laura, first of all, for such a kind introduction. So I have the uh, unenviable task here of talking about uh, both stripping down this, what I consider the myth of hybrids, the overblown myth of hybrids. Um, even though hybrids for many of the farmers that I work with today and through all of these years have, have worked out okay sometimes, but uh, mainly they've worked out because there hasn't been enough emphasis on the non-hybrids, on the OPs. But I'm going to tie this in, this topic of uh, talk comparing OPs and hybrids and their relative strengths with talking about something I've really just gotten infected with in the past few months of really starting to understand what the true vibrancy, the true diversity of a, of a real seed system looks like. Well, I say the last few months, the last 10 years. Um, every few months I get to kind of a new plateau, but when Matthew Dillon and I started Organic Seed Alliance, which I'll talk about, why don't I talk about that a little bit, um, it really was to get, uh, it was, we saw an incredible need for farmers to really know how to grow seed uh, professionally in this case. That's what re OSA has really always been primarily about, is helping farmers who wanted to grow high quality um, seed that could really be used uh, for other farmers with all those traits that are necessary. So without further ado, let's talk about OSA quickly here. Uh, organic Seed Lines, I live on the beautiful Olympic Peninsula of Washington, west of Seattle. And um, OSA started there in Port Townsend. This is a spinach field in Squim, Washington, which is just a little bit west of us, even further. And it's in a beautiful, they call it the blue hole of Squim. It can be cloudy everywhere else in the, what we now call the Salish Sea area, formerly the Puget Sound. And it can be uh, gray everywhere else, and you can go to Squim, and you, get, you find the blue hole. Squim is spelled S-E-Q-U-I-M. And it is a world-class site for, for as much of Western Washington is, as well as Western British Columbia, Southwestern British Columbia, and Western Oregon is one of the ideal climates on Earth for a raft of different vegetable seed crops. Really why I'm there. I like hot weather, and we never get it. I love this hot weather. It was like, oh man, I'm going, it's going to be 100, I'm going to really warm my bones. <laughs> and this is what happens. <laughs> okay, so we're a nonprofit. We do a lot of different functions, uh, advocacy, uh, education, outreach, working with the farmers. Whatever we see that the farmers really need to be supported, that's what we do to um, and this is really uh, our Christina Hubbard, who I work with, wrote some of this, and Michaela Colley. I've got to put a word in for my wonderful staff, too. Incredible group of people that we've been blessed with. Jared Zeistro, uh, a, our junior plant breeder, and a phenomenal plant breeder he is. And uh, Christina Hubbard has got away with words, as does uh, my best friend, Michaela Colley. Um, genetic resources need to be conserved, carefully managed, but we also truly believe that genetic resources, as I'll show you during this presentation, are, do constantly co-evolve with the humans who select them and who use them. And if you really have vital varieties that really work for people, really feed people, then there is a constant interplay of the <laughs> farmer and the variety of the selection both natural and the farmer selection, as well as uh, adapting to all of these changes. So, uh, without talking about everything we do, what the, the number one 10 gallon hat that I wear is the uh, research doing the breeding work, which we actively do with farmers. I, don't, I do not do any plant breeding that doesn't involve an equal partnership with farmers. And so um, this is a cornfield in uh, Farmington, Minnesota, Martin and Atina Diffley's farm. Atina's become a real rock star now that she wrote 
uh, her book. Has everyone heard, of, have everyone heard about Turn Here Sweet Corn yet? Uh, go read Turn Here Sweet Corn. Phenomenal. Story of the Diffley's farm. Martin Diffley, her husband, uh, started in organics in 1973. Is the, certainly the, the longest certified organic farmer in the state of Minnesota. And maybe... Uh, the longest certified organic farmer in the country. But no one knows sweet corn like Martin. Uh, anyway, uh, essentially, you can read this. I hate just ra reading off the slides. So the, the whole idea here is genetically resilient and very important, and I'll make this uh, point a couple of times, is essentially what, we, what has come to be known now as open source or... Uh, basically public domain with some caveats. And you can read more about that on the Organic Seed Alliance website. We're trying to find ways that we can make sure that the crop genetic resources that we all depend on for our life stay in the hands of the people and not the corporations. So that's a big push. And one of the best ways to do that is for us to start breeding the stuff that we need. So every, my world is centered on farmers and working with the farmers, helping the farmers. This is Frank Morton, Wild Garden Seed. Any of you into salad mix or leafy greens need to know about Frank and Wild Garden Seed. Um, he has been a seedsman for at least 20 years now. He was a vegetable farmer who got into seeds, and he's now quite a plant breeder of renown. A uh, number of his varieties are available through all of the major catalogs uh, that sell veggies to organic farmers, veggie seed to organic farmers. And uh, this is why we're in this game. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about participatory plant breeding, and I just realized, doggone it, the change from Mac to PC. I lost my headers here. Oh, no. Oh, oh no, it's just... <laughs> It's this where we go nice and slow. My students used to do this fancy stuff. It always drove me nuts. But anyway, okay, here we go. Uh, the way I have it set up on my Mac, it's to, I don't have to go through step by step. Anyway, this is a wonderful photograph from the, uh, the oldest wheat breeding uh, program in the world, the one that was started in the 1890s at Washington State University before the rediscovery of Mendel's Laws. And uh, this is not from the 1890s. You, all you have to do is look at the fedora, and you can, if you're good at knowing your fedoras, you can peg the decade. I'm not that good. I'd, I'd guess, I'd, I'd guess 30s is, yeah, my guess. Um, and notice also, so the here, here are, um, this is, uh, by the way, these slides are courtesy of uh, Kevin Murphy, who is the organic wheat breeder now, currently. He only works on organic breeding at Washington State University wheat and also um, quinoa, very nicely. Uh, anyway, this is basically the breeding program, and uh, are these guys really the farmers, as uh, Kevin says here, they're the hired help. I'm sure they're, f I'm sure they're farm boys uh, who have a job at the university, but here it is. You can see who's doing the work. You can see who's wearing the ties, right? <laughs> That's the best part. Okay says a lot. There they are. So that's, you know, participatory plant breeding, which I'll talk a wee bit more about. Uh, here is now our modern version. This picture was taken, I think, two years ago out at Nash Huber's farm there in Squim. I'll talk about Nash quite a bit. already have a bit. And lo and behold, there's uh, Dr. Stephen Jones, renowned uh, organic wheat breeder and geneticist, Bending over while Nash is barking the orders here. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank God things have changed. <laughs> this is really, this is uh, all kidding aside. Um, this is, uh, I take participatory plant breeding, which I could do a whole a nice hour presentation on if we had the time. but. PPB is basically where the farmer and the breeder work together in true consort, as, as, true, as true equals, shoulder to shoulder, and no fooling around and no pulling the PhD card or any of that stuff. And uh, 
it's it's wonderful. It's changed my life. And Nash is one of my my main guys who knows how to do it. Nash grew up on a farm in uh, near Carbondale, Illinois, and uh, he's in his early seventies now. And he remembers most of the crops that they grew. They saved their seed on there at the farm that he grew up on. So when he got to Squim, Washington and couldn't get the carrot seed that he needed, he said, heck, I, I used to grow seed back on the farm. I can grow some seed. So he went into carrot seed production and also doing his own selection. We have the great benefit of having less Queen Anne's lace than you folks do. This, of course, to many of you, just looks like he's standing out in roadside in Queen Anne's Lace, but that is carrots. Um, uh, it is encroaching. It's amazing how fast that that, uh, that weed is, that weedy species of what we call wild carrot is moving in. And so we now have crews. We actually have, this is some of the wonderful things in Washington State, we actually have the extension agent now for the uh, Clallam County, where this picture was taken, where this carrot seed is being grown who will send out crews to, to scout for Qu Queen Anne's Lace because they respect that this is a very important economic activity for Nash Schuber. This is not my favorite picture of Nash's carrots, but it was a good one because it even shows the 25-pound sacks. Here's Nash's farm stand in uh, rainy, drizzly fall day in, in Port Townsend, Washington, where I live, about six blocks from where I live. Um, these carrots have become, Nash has a production system I could also easily speak for an hour on, and I've got to speed up here, but, uh, or I'll never get through this doggone thing. But uh, these carrots are uh, an old OP. He doesn't tell anyone where, what it originally was, but it's no longer available. I, he, I'm one of the three people he's t actually told what it really is. Um, but... Uh, these carrots, this is, and what I wished is you could see the label there. There's a label that's called Nash's Best. And when you, when I meet almost practically anyone, especially the alternative community, from the city of Seattle and environs, they say, oh, you live out there and you work with farmers? Do you know Nash? They're all like Nash groupies. <laughs> and his carrots, his Nance carrots that he... Uh, we have one of the largest co-op systems in the country, the PCC co-ops, Puget Sound, um, in the Seattle area, seven stores. It's kind of like the Wedge in, in Twin Cities. And um, uh, people there, if there's a break in Nash's production or it gets too wet in November especially and you can't get equipment into the field to harvest carrots, and there's like a w one or two week break in the carrots, people start complaining big time to the produce managers at PCC and they say, we do not want those tent pigs from California. They're awful. That's what we call them. <laughs> These are you know, beautiful Nance carrots. And what's so beautiful about this is Nash produces about 35, 40 acres every year of this. And about two-thirds of it is from his own seed. He still relies on one hybrid. He's got two OPs that we're now working to improve, select, and maintain. So he is producing, you know, at a time he produces a uh, couple, couple 300 pounds of carrot seed for his production. So it's got to be good because it's going to the stores. He can't have off types and all of that. So this has been fun. Okay, now let's talk about the fabric. So what I, the last thing I was going to say, now I remember the other thing about this going to a doggone PC on my Mac. I've got this little strip there where I've got my notes in that I can read off the thing, the little cheater's notes. Anyway, it's gone on this one. I wonder why that happened. Uh, so anyway, uh, what I was going to say is this, folks, is quite simply, and I think the point will be made again during this talk, this is the way that all seeds used to be. If you produced carrots, you either grew the seed yourself or you had someone in your community or region that you traded with for that seed. And maybe the trade was for cash money sometimes, though, of course, anyone even who's my age who grew up on a farm knows that farms were not as heavily into the cash economy in days of yore as they are today. So um, there, was, there was some international commerce in seeds going way back. Uh, melons got from... Uh, 
uh, from India to China long before anyone even knew there were trade routes there, so they must have been handed from person to person, you know, every one mile at a time. But um, the, the point here is seeds and your involvement with seeds was an everyday reality of being a farmer. It was as much a part of the fabric of being a farmer and what you did, and it was a much, as much of a reflection of whether you ate or not and whether you, um, in, as time went on, were successful in other ways, more monetarily based. And it, the hard thing for many people to realize is that it really wasn't until the 1880s that there was any kind of widespread seed companies, regional seed companies indeed, but pre-1880s, they ain't that long ago, my grandmother, who I knew well, was born in 1888. So I knew somebody from when seed was basically a regional traded thing. Isn't that amazing? Really, when you think about that, that always is what gets me. So let's talk about this history of seeds so we can get into the nitty-gritty of why we need new open-pollinated seed systems. Okay, so all crops are domesticated in... Uh, some of you, I hope a lot of you know this story because I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'm sure everyone in Seed Savers knows the story of uh, Nikolai Vavilov. I have my Russian friends pronounce it Vavilov. Um, but his centers of origin, which are unique... Uh, here, I was changing this just a little while ago. Uh, very topographically diverse areas of the world. I'll show you a quick map of that. But seed was a major trade item. It certainly was. So seed did travel. And that's why seed did disseminate across the landscape as much as it did. And uh, I will describe, once I show tomatoes too here, this whole idea of where the variation uh, comes from, but whenever, well, let's, uh, let me show you some, uh, some slopes where people are farming before I talk about how these hybrid events happened and how they were so radically uh, important. Uh, but anyway, ag crops were maintained, here's a take-home message, until the 1880s, basically all agricultural crops were maintained as what people very frequently now call land races, I once heard someone say they prefer to call them farmer varieties instead of land race, because land race, uh, really, uh, the expectation there is that they are of the land, whereas it's really a combination of, of the land and the environment and the human hands that do the selection and the nurturing and the domestication. All of our crop plants were wild plants at one time, most of them barely edible, and were selected by human beings who never went to school a day in their life. Um, so, well-maintained material didn't happen until the 1880s. So here's a quick snapshot, just so I can talk about tomatoes for a second. Um, so here are the, you've probably read about this, if you really get into the centers of origin or uh, areas of diversity, you will find that there are, oh, you could spend your whole life just studying this, and there are different theories on how many of these there are, and none of that's that important to me right now. The point is, all of these areas are very topographically diverse, meaning usually altitude, very quick, steep hillsides, and, and lots of microclimates therein. So it was Vavilov's idea that, in fact, because of the diversity of the selection pressure of these areas, and also of the humans there who were trying to carve out an existence under challenging conditions, that in fact, this is why this domestication happens so quickly and so radically in these areas. So let's talk about tomatoes for a second. This, by the way, is a wonderful photograph I've harbored for, har harbored for years. David, do you recognize that photograph? <laughs> it's one of yours. And I think it was even a stipulation of, well, now don't go spreading that picture around. So I guard it very guardedly, and I only show it once every few years, and thank you, but this was a good time, since I knew you'd be in the audience, too. Anyway, um, 
This is, you know, a, a classic, wonderful David Cavaniero photo of tomatoes. The, the, the really interesting part of this, if I can do this quickly, is if you look on the map of the Americas, uh, area number 8A is where the wild tomatoes were originally um, uh, selected, where, they, where they, their center of origin was 8A. Uh, by the time that the conquistadors landed in the area of what is now southern Mexico, Guatemala, uh, there was, in fact, a semi-domesticated form of tomatoes growing. Semi-domesticated, and also David is going to, you're going to do crop origins tomorrow, is it? So hopefully you'll talk about this, so that'll save, save me a few minutes here. He'll talk about this, but the, the key is that blows my mind is the conquistadors showed up there in the early 1500s. The semi-domesticated, as best as we can tell, the semi-domesticated, I wish I could pronounce it in the, whatever the Mayan tongue is, Oh, well, that's Espanol, my dear, isn't it? Yes. Tom Tomala or something, right? Anyway, the, the, the key is here, the tomatoes that they took back to Spain first and then disseminated to Italy especially were small, were basically cherry tomatoes. There hadn't been a lot of breeding, breeding work by the Mayan peoples of that area. They used it. It was truly a minor crop. In Europe, it didn't spread very quickly because everyone thought it was poisonous. Or all of, the, all of the paler people in the north thought it was poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> Here's where I'm going to show off of being Italian now. The Spanish and the Italians embraced it immediately, and they ate some, and they didn't drop dead, and they said, what are they worried about? Let's make a tomato sauce. <laughs> Let's make some gravy. Uh, someone who knows that the Italian, the real Italians call it gravy. Anyway, um, so all of this variation that you see here happened in a two to three hundred year period from a bunch of cherry tomatoes that disseminated across the, the landscape in very diverse climates, were selected. How do new varieties happen? The selection of the humans who decide to give them extra effort and domesticate them. The climatic influence, that is natural selection, and then good old recombination in genetic terms, where new combinations are coming up all of the time, both from something called transposons, which I'll only mention passingly, but also um, just good old combination and recombination of the DNA, for any of you who've ever studied genetics. And when in a unique shape, color, or size, how do they go from cherries to these big beef steaks in two or three hundred years from nothing. It was because they had eyes on the ground. Every farmer, every eater was a seed grower. And they were it totally tuned in to watching for variation and picking the best. It was plant breeding at its best by people who were in tune. And so when you have things like uh, really diverse landscapes, this is potatoes in the Andes, um, it really puts your, the environment at the top of this field is different than the environment at the bottom of this field. So the selection pressure of nature is different from the bottom to the top. And by the way, I don't know, this uh, slide came from, Dr. Robert Bug, Bob Bug. Guess what he does for a living? <laughs> he's, an he's an entomologist. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's a friend of ours. Uh, anyway, Bob sent me this. I said, because Bob is doing a, a project I'll just mention, because I promised him I'd mention it, called, um, now I've got to remember, MAP, uh, which is Mountain Agricultural practices project, but it's basically how can we study and work with people in mountainous regions to reestablish this wonderful proving ground for selecting new genetic variability that they have 
in many cases they have lost doing that kind of selection that brought us these varieties in the first place. Okay, so now I'm going to show you, I mentioned transposable elements. Anyone uh, who's really interested in reading a little sciencey but very well written, there's a wonderful book about uh, a preeminent uh, female geneticist, uh, Dr. Barbara McClintock, uh, who devoted her life to studying something called transposons, which basically what transposons do is they shift genes around within the genome from, uh, from one part of the chromosome to another and from chromosome to chromosome. Amazing. And this picture Bob sent me, he's been studying all this uh, South American Andean agriculture, uh, though I believe this was from Guatemala. This is in a white cornfield in Guatemala. These are representatives, and this is where I need my little thing to get the name right, but these are called, these are the border row varieties. They plant these wild colored ones only on the edge of the plot because most of their corn for the year, they want to be white. So if you go deep into the plot, most of it's white with occasional colored ear, but they always save these wildly colored ones separately and plant them on the border of the plots. Why? Because they have learned through experience, through being incredible observers, that when these are present, there's more adaptive change that is available in their crop to go through s genetic selection. If they grow the white strain without the, color, the colors, as Dr. McClintock uh, found many years ago when people thought she was crazy. Uh, feeling for the Organism. A Feeling for the Organism is the name of the book. Any of you interested in women in science, it's absolutely phenomenal. They thought she was absolutely crazy. Number one, because she was a woman uh, back in those days. Number two, because this was just kooky. The, they, and people made fun of it. It's, oh, it's just jumping genes, right? Which is what some people call transposons. Um, but this is what by keep, whenever they wouldn't plant this on the edge of the field, their, uh, their robustness of their crop would go down by trying to keep it pure white. Why? Because the transposons are linked often to color, as Dr. McClintock found. Okay, what happens when you don't keep your stuff diverse? Well, Teddy Morlock found out what happens when you grow tw spinach on the same piece of ground 25 years straight. Dr. Morlock passed away a couple of years ago, and I th he was up to about 30 years on this. This is the Kibler Ag Station, University of Arkansas. Um, Teddy grew all of his spinach here, and if it, didn't, if it couldn't live through Kibler, it wasn't worth messing with. <laughs> and guess what, folks? This is the kind of disasters that would happen, the kind of challenging situations that are actually happening right now here in Norte America, huh? So, um, and this is why we had fun looking at that lettuce this morning. It kind of looked like this. For those of you who are up there with me, that was the most exciting field I've seen in a long time. <laughs> I know, that they always laugh. I, when I was, you know, in the formal seed business, they, the sales guys in California would say, you sound like a damn pathologist. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is, this is how we breed disease resistance, and Teddy's material has got the best white rust resistance, which is really the bad disease there. N they've never found single genes for resistance. He's got by far the best white rust res resistance. In fact, every sp any spinach they grow anywhere in Arkansas, Texas, uh, is all comes out, was run through this nursery. Now, is there still variability in our crop plants? So I thought when I first got into this, God, we're using all, losing all the variability, and I'll tell you quickly, I thought, well, you know, there's variability across varieties. This variety is more variable, you know, has got a different variation than another variety, and if you put them all together, like in that tomato picture, you see all that incredible variety. What I've come to learn and love and devoted my life's work to is how do you get Intervarietal variety. Does it make sense? Intervarietal. Yeah, you, within the variety, how do you get the diversity in that's needed? Now, when I was working at a large seed company, uh, some 
Seeds people from Italy showed up and they said, oh, we want you to look at our spinach. This is the best spinach in southern Italy. This is what all of the farmers grow. I thought some spanking new, totally uniform deal. I was totally shocked when I planted the seed out of this commercial packet of spinach 15 years ago, and this is what I got. I was blown away. I was ready to... I could, I could breed six new varieties of spinach out of that one variety. I could start a whole breeding program out of that one packet of seed. Really, literally. And so the point here is variation like this and like that spinach, I don't know if you can see the beautiful color variation in this. This is uh, Varagata de Chioggia, which is from northern Italy. It is basically a radicchio. We just call them the chicories. We have found the chicories are the best winter green leafy vegetable where we live, where it gets down to about 14, 15 degrees is our cold temperature for the winter. And when we plant a population like this, can you see the color? Can you see the color out there at all? The greens and reds. This is what a lot of Italian chicory still look like. When you get, or radicchios certainly, when you get the really uniform radicchios that go to market in Northern Europe and, and uh, here in the USA, those are hybrids bred by the Dutch who took Italian seed and made hybrids, which we're gonna talk about. This is real variation that, I, this is seed I bought in a packet from the small company Seeds from Italy here in Kansas that imports Italian seed. And uh, it's what, there's a wealth of variation in there. And it's not just color variation. We run it through our nursery. There's differential rotting rates. Uh, I, don't know what, I don't even know the diseases yet, I'm just learning. And there, the cold hardiness different plant to plant variation is amazing. So we've been selecting for uh, a variety that will go through our cold winters so we can be eating uh, chicories all winter long, which I've done the last two winters from the field. Farmer varieties are genetically resilient. So all of these, what I defined originally as land race, farmer varieties are, uh, up until the 1880s, uh, they were all, everything was much more variable than modern varieties adapted to the challenges of the specific geographic regions where they came from. There was always, this is a big one, folks, strong natural selection on the material. People were not pampering it. People were not, wa you know, didn't have sophisticated irrigation. And so when you put plants under stress, like we saw up on the ridge today with the kind of weather you all have been having, and that 100, 100 or close to 100 degree weather, the variation, you start to really see the variation. And that, then you have an opportunity to work in concert with natural selection, if you care to improve your crops, just like our ancestors did. They would be all over that lettuce field we went and saw that was three quarters of it was dead from disease and some of them were alive and also beautiful cabbage up there. So agronomically, these were these older Pre-modern period were rustic by our standards today, though there are many varieties in the Seed Savers uh, collection that are truly these farmer varieties. And um, the, the neat thing is after the 1880s and the advent of seed catalogs is there was still, from what I've been able to determine, still a lot more variety left into the varieties that were bred between the 1880s and World War II. It was really, we only got on the uniformity kick post-World War II, except for king corn, of course. That started a little earlier. So let's talk about hybrid corn. So 1850, Charles Darwin was actually the first one to ever document making corn hybrids. The, I've talked to a couple of geneticists who told me the Anasazi actually would maintain separate parental types and make some hybrids in sweet corn. Uh, that's really interesting stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, by 1900 was, Darwin did this and he noted hybrid vigor. He documented it very well, it's a fascinating read. But uh, it wasn't until 1900 that corn really became the model organism in the whole revolution that you have on all sides of you in Iowa, not so much in this part of Iowa, but most places really started. And uh, with the rediscovery of um, Mendel's laws, people started to uh, make inbreds and make hybrids and um, of course Pioneer was started in Des Moines by Henry Wallace, uh, one time vice president and he, 
he bred the Copper Cross in the 20s in his backyard in Des Moines was the first commercial hybrid ever. Um, the, the, the neat thing in the history of hybrids without have being reactionary and completely anti-hybrid is the early plant breeders who worked on hybrid corn, first of all, they were all men. I guess that goes without saying, really. But they were all farm boys, and they knew which end of the plant goes in the ground, as my old boss used to say. And they knew what was important to the farmer. So people always say, oh, well, hybrid corn, yield, 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 right? Well, it's certainly that's the, the song they always sing. But in the early days, it was stalk quality and disease resistance. Most OP corns, so I'm told, in large fields, will, you'll lose 5 to 10% based on uh, poor stalk quality and any kind of windstorm like the windstorm you all, sounds like you had last week. So um, once they bred these early generation hybrids, they went from zero to 60 in some counties in Iowa and adjoining states, but Iowa was really first, Iowa and Illinois, uh, in 10 to 12 years, which is pretty amazing. And this was during the 19, really late 20s, really the 1930s, folks, when uh, those 1930s dollars were a little bit rarer than they were at other times. Onions put in a bid for, in the 1920s in California, they first bred hybrid onions. Anyway, here's a map, and you, I know you can't read that, but heck. Uh, this is the spread of hybrids. E each black county there, you can see uh, Iowa represented strongly in northern Illinois. Um, each blackened uh, county is where they were growing in, so starting in 1936, I don't know if you can even read the dates, 36 to 48 but 10% uh, of the corn in hybrid. That's how fast it went. That's 10%, and of course by 48, it, in many of those counties was much higher than 10%. Wildfire. Why did her hybrids work so well? Well, uh, I through the inbreeding process, uh, making inbred lines, which are the parents of hybrids, you sort out deleterious traits. It allows you to see them clearly and eliminate them, okay? So if you can find, they would often start uh, trying to make a thousand new inbreds and they'd be lucky out of uh, making a thousand selves or starting a thousand uh, inbred lines if they could find one that really worked. Because most of them suffered from inbreeding depression so badly, especially in the early days, that they were immediately eliminated from the programs. And again, remember, these were farm boys. They knew what a corn plant was supposed to look like. So they, you know, rolled up their sleeves and looked at tens of thousands of inbreds sometimes to find one or two good working inbred lines. Now, can everybody see these pictures? I'm so conscious of this stuff maybe not showing up. Can you see the corn on the right there? So that basically is, uh, this is not how hybrids are made. This is showing you the two parental types on left and right uh, that went into making the hybrid that's planted down the middle. So you take two short, uh, very inbred inbreds that were at least strong enough that they did not die from the inbreeding work and had some redeeming traits, and you found two of them that were complementary, and you cross them, and voila. There it is in the middle, and those are the ears of the two, inbre two inbreds of a specific hybrid corn and there's the hybrid in the middle. And there were people who were run out of town as crazy. Uh, some of the plant breeders at several of the universities early on, it was like, what the hell are you doing? You're not breeding corn if it's all no bigger than chest high. And that's what some of the inbreds were. And today the inbreds are as, are as big as the OPs were in the 40s. Uh, also, you know what, I'm gonna skip the thing in the bottom, but it just shows you how fast, it's actually a, it shows you each spot is for uh, bushels per acre and, and how fast it went up from hybrids. So um, I'm not here to sing the praises, but it's a pretty amazing thing, and it wouldn't have spread across the countryside if it hadn't worked, because you know what farmers do. Any of you have ever worked with farmers? As Laura said, I, I grew up a, not a, quite a city kid, a, a s suburban brat, and I never stepped foot on a farm till I was 17. Now I can't get off them. But, um, which is good, the way I like it.
But um, uh, farmers pick up new ideas by looking over the fence post, right? They still do that, and they've always done that. Okay, now, so why are hybrids favored by seed companies? So I, this, is, this is quick, but this is important to know. Why did the hybrids latch on? I mean, why did the companies latch on so quickly? Once the parental inbreds are fixed, then it is easy to make the hybrids one year after year. I'm not going to go through how hybrids are made, unfortunately, but I think everybody knows. It's a, you guys are such a, a much more educated audience than, than most. You have two parental types, as you just saw in that last slide, and you cross them. So you can maintain those two parental types as very uh, homogeneous, uh, very um, uh, uniform parental types. And every time you want to make some new hybrid seed, you just plant them out in the field, you detassel one and let the other one make pollen, and voila, you har harvest hybrid seed. So it's, they've been inbred so much, those parents, that they're very easy to maintain, unlike OPs. Open pollinated, in, at least in the cross-pollinated species, have all that variation, right? You all are seed savers. You've seen it, right? Everybody sees it? Shake your head, do something, yeah. All that crazy variation, you can see it in all the gardens here. That's, that's a normal part of life, especially in the cross-pollinated species, but even in the selfers, honestly. And uh, once you inbreed the hell out of it, you've basically made it so genetically narrow that you don't see it. There, the variation is gone. That's why hybrids are so uniform. Two uniform parents make a very uniform hybrid, an even more uniform hybrid. So uh, they, the, the companies liked it because hybrids allowed instant proprietary ownership. As long as you maintained your own inbreds and didn't give it to anybody else, you were the only one that could make that copper cross hybrid and sell it. Whereas previous to that, you, if you, when Ferry Morse released Detroit Dark Red in 1902, within three years, every home garden seed, it was such a good variety, every home garden uh, farmer seed company in America had Detroit Dark Red. So the owners of the, of the seed companies loved this little trick this little wizardry, and, if, and the breeders liked it because the stacking the traits, it's actually easier to breed hybrids than it is a good OP. Okay, so now what are the disadvantages? So we can cut to the chase here, and I'm not watching the clock, and God forbid I'm probably going to run out of time. Oh, you're cute. You're why you got my back. God, it's so nice to have <laughs> friends, truly. By the way, I didn't say it at the beginning, but I feel really honored to be here and be amongst so many wonderful old friends and new friends, and truly to be uh, asked back is wonderful. It's been 22 years since I've been here, and I'm tickled, and I have a real big soft spot for Iowa and the upper Midwest anyway. Um, so let's talk about this so I can get through this. Inbred lines are genetically narrow. I already said that. You're, you're inbreeding them. That's why so many of them die from inbreeding depression. You reveal these uh, deleterious traits and you narrow their genetic base so much that they're, they're not adapting and evolving like our older varieties were at the hands of the humans that kept them. They didn't have all of that variation. In fact, in studies of inbred lines, they found that the best inbred lines tend to have less of McClintock's transposable elements, which means they were stayed stable much easier and part of the reason the companies loved them so much. So it's kind of, it is anti-evolutionary. Um, so inbreds, when you grow inbred seed, and I worked at a seed company where I grew inbred line seed, they are weaklings. You have to pour on the chemicals. You have to use more water, more fertility. They, you really do have to baby them. They are prima donnas, as we call them in the biz. Um, F1's focus uh, is often not on the best traits. You know, what are the best? A friend that always talks about what's good and what's best. Uh, it's, and they're really focused on the traits that are good for these centralized systems uh, where we do high put agriculture. And it's the, it's the wedding of modern science, reductionist science, and, and High, high input, high output, right? And that's not the way Mother Nature normally works. 
Vandana Shiva, I heard her on the radio a couple days ago. She has a wonderful thing. You can go to Bill Moyers and Company. has this great radio show. In fact, it was on this early this morning. They were playing it. Again, repeat. And uh, she talks about how the focus of science has been reductionist. And it's all about how can we figure out the, the input to get exactly what we need to get the right output. But at that, part, you, at that point, you're taking a lot of nature out of the system and the new variation that gives us all of the diversity that we all honor so much here today just doesn't show up nearly as much. So when you seed, to save seed from the hybrids, of course, then, if, as a gardener, everybody here knows, because you all have been schooled in this, that they don't breed true. And you don't save seed from hybrids. Though there's an, always an exception to that. So take my class and we'll talk about the exception. So seed growing becomes a very centralized, very specialized, very top-down sort of thing. A hundred years ago, all farmers had knowledge of how to grow seed for most of their top-line crops. We have lost, if you want to talk about loss of diversity, the diversity of people who know how to grow seed is, 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 is as tragic as losing the genetic variation itself. Okay, yes. Five, oh no. What are the advantages of open pollinated varieties? Well, they carry this variability. I showed you that. That's genetic. That results in genetic resilience. OP varieties can be bred to be tough at all stages. If you have that variability in, we select them for all stages. You can do that with hybrids too, but it's, it's easier if you have that built-in genetic resilience. They can be very regionally adapted and continue or always be adapting year in and year out. When do we need things like that? Right now when we're going through this climate chaos that everyone I speak to all over the country is going through. Um, when you save seed, they do breed true if you've followed your isolation and all of that properly. And uh, varieties are not lost due to a business decision. Many of the farmers I work with, what got them to go back to OP seeds is they were sick and tired of Seed companies all of a sudden dropping hybrid varieties that they'd actually come to know and love and learn to cater their system to. And all of a sudden it was gone one day. They s in fact, that was a lot of Nash's uh, initial uh, business sense with his carrot production. Is I'm never having that happen again. All farmers can be seed growers. They can certainly be breeders with this regionally based advantage. Now, what are the disadvantages of OPs? Well. OPs are genetically variable, not always consistent. I don't know if any of you get frustrated on the garden scale of not getting uh, as much uh, uniformity as perhaps you would like, or some cabbage heads don't really, cabbage plants don't really make a head, or you know something like that. But um, part of that is operative term there is can be, and if we do our selection and upkeep and learn how to do that adaptation, then we can. Uh, they are harder to maintain as selection. I can attest to that, having bred both hybrids and OPs. Hi OPs are much harder to breed something that's genetically resilient. You keep in enough variability to keep it strong and yet get it uniform enough. It's like a, uh, some sort of, uh, oh, there's a word for that and I can't think of it, but it's a real paradox. How do I get it uniform enough but keep it variable enough? Um, how does a seed company keep varieties exclusive if we're just producing OPs and anybody can go and grow it? That's a biggie. Uh, and the question that I ask all the seed growers I work with is what is the incentive for you to grow seed? Is there a business incentive? Now, if I still have a couple of minutes, do I still have three? I'll give it to you. Uh, you're going to lay it on me. And then, and then we still need our questions and answers, right? Okay. Uh, I want to go back. This is one of the only pictures I could find of Martin Diffley. He's he's very mysterious guy. He hides. Uh, he's the one with the hat there, the sharp looking guy with the well ironed shirt out in the field. Anyway, Marty knows Bill Tracy, who's really the preeminent corn plant breeder, 
uh, in the United States, at least academically, um, from the University of Wisconsin, good friend of ours, um, and uh, cooperator on this project. Uh, he, he claims that Martin Diffley knows more about uh, growing sweet corn and understands it better than any other human being he's ever met. And coming from Bill Tracy, that means a hell of a lot. So this is a wonderful project that we started several years ago because Martin was completely, finally fed up with all the hybrids. He'd been growing hybrid corn. He did uh, 25, 30 acres of corn a year. Anyone who's ever bought sweet corn at the Wedge Co-op in Minneapolis knows Marty's corn, Gardens of Vegan corn. And uh, how many people have eaten Gardens Vegan corn? I've eaten a lot of it, thank God. I go to Minnesota every summer just to eat the, just to do this. More, most fun you can have. Most fun you can have with your clothes on, right? <laughs> okay. Um, Adrian Shelton is, um, Adrian is now our lead on this project. This is a wonderful young uh, plant breeder who works with Bill Tracy. He's developed a nice relationship with Marty, and she's the lead on this, and I'll just tell you a thing or two about it. Martin was frustrated because the... Uh, the newest hybrids did not have good cold soil emergence. The hybrids he was buying 15, 20 years ago had better cold soil emergence than the hybrids he was buying today, at least in his market class for the Twin Cities area there, that latitude, et cetera. And, of course, Martin is fanatical about quality. He had to be sw the sweetest and the most tender. So he truly, uh, he and I were talking about it one day, and... I said, you know what, Martin, you, you're the perfect guy to do one of these projects right on your farm. All we have to do is plant the, the start a population, work with Bill Tracy, and plant the stuff 10 days earlier than anyone would dare ever think of doing. And that's what we started to do. This is actually a subpopulation from California. I didn't have a good one. But we planted out every spring these uh, breeding materials that Bill Tracy first uh, generated and willingly gave to us as a cooperative, both OSA and uh, Gardens Vegan Farm. And um, we started to plant it out, and this is a good stand. Sometimes the field would be, three quarters of the, of the lines would not come up because we'd, we'd plant it just right. And that's what we wanted to find out. So we s have now selected for four cycles for cold soil germ. The, popu the two populations we have going uh, in this, and then we select for other things. Let me tell you about this. We we get a lot of smut up in Martin's field. You all know what that looks like. Wheat lacoche, uh, which is of course the Mexicans love. I've cooked it, and I had people explain to me exactly how to do it. I never thought it was that great, but uh, I'm a smoi spoiled white boy. But anyway, um, the. Uh, um, the thing here is, uh, and I'm even cutting down way on the colloquialisms here because I'm in front of uh, <laughs> God. No comment. Anyway, so we, we, Rust, hey, I'm out of time. I'm about to cut you off. Rust, your Rust, we've been selecting for Rust, which we get in Martin's Field, just not for pure uh, immunity to Rust, but low incidence of Rust major disease, uh, low incidence of northern corn leaf blight, if I have that right, and low incidence of, of this. And we have of, of, uh, smut, corn porn. And uh, <laughs> I can't help myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, okay, now they're going to cut me off. Okay, anyway, it's like being the bad comedian, right? Um, anyway, um, we have two populations now that we can reliably plant 10 days to two weeks earlier than anybody in the area plants, and most of it comes up. We're still selecting. We have material that's, uh, because Martin Diffley was there for every tasting, and Bill Tracy, to having those two of them together, the two biggest fanatic, most knowledgeable biters in the country, is just totally a thrill. It's like, man, I'd pay big money to go a do that all day with them. I get to eat corn with those two guys for two days in a row straight. And it, it's, it's, it's a blast. Anyway, we have this incredible variety that's coming down the pike. There'll be two new open pollinated, high quality sweet corns produced with seed produced here in the Midwest for you. And then you can keep your own strain 
and select it under your own microclimate. So what do we need? We need a decentralized system where we have opportunities like this, where we can breed something like these OP corns, have them maintained in the air area of intended use, in fact, even produce the seed. We're looking into that now. We have an experimental half-acre plot of it in uh, West Madison, Wisconsin right now. I'm going to see in three weeks and get to taste test it. Um, but we need regional seed companies who understand the needs of those farmers and who are, are willing to produce the seed of what they need. We need skilled regional seed folks who just know how to do what our ancestors did, did selecting it. We need to reinvigorate agriculture with seed growing knowledge. And the open source model to me, uh, which has some caveats, anyone who knows about open source software can look it up and it's be a little bit different. We'll be publishing on the Organic Seed Alliance website on this, uh, seedalliance.org. You can find us anytime, seedalliance.org. Um, always great information there because we have some great writers. Uh, but we are, we firmly stand for abolishing all patenting of life forms and an open source seed for people. So with that, I'll say goodbye. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.